Well, welcome everybody to uh, another video in the Speaking Lions Fragments of Sense series. Um, this is a companion video to uh, the much longer one um, on our current subject of education. Uh, uh, put out recently, um, in which I and my friend and collaborator Vlad Popescu discuss some of the ideas about education uh, found in the great 20th century political philosophers Michael Oakeshott and Leo Strauss. And certainly one of the things that is central to the thinking of both Oakeshott and Strauss is the importance of in, the importance in education and especially in university of education and I'm focusing here almost exclusively on, on university education um, is the study of the great books of what used to be often commonly called Western civilization. So what I'm doing in this piece is to uh, simply offer to anyone who might have the great good fortune to study uh, a course of education uh, based on uh, great books. Um, to offer some tips that might or might not be helpful to you in your education. Um, so the video is actually based on an article that I published in Quillette back in February of 2020, so that's just over a year ago. And essentially what I'm going to say uh, follows that article, which if you want to sort of read it at your leisure and read the original, then just, just uh, go to Quillette, uh, the online magazine, uh, for February, 20th of February, sorry, 23rd of February 2020, and you'll find the article there. Um, so I'm going to follow, uh, basically follow that article, uh, repeating sometimes verbatim, uh, substantial chunks of it, but also paraphrasing other parts, uh, maybe adding in a few extra thoughts, uh, impromptu thoughts, some ad libs. Um, and anyway, I hope that you will will find what I have to say uh, of some uh, of some value. Well, um, I'm writing this. Uh, I live in Australia. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so some of my examples that the article starts off with are taken from Australian universities. Uh, but I think the situation is similar in the UK and, and perhaps, perhaps I think actually less so in the United States. But anyway, uh, certainly some of the, these opening remarks will, will not be unfamiliar to anyone. Uh, in a modern Western university. Because um, those universities, uh, if they have uh, any outstanding skill, it's their capacity uh, of their marketing departments to produce opportunistic hype, um, which is often distilled into titillating slogans like, and here are a few random examples that have been used by various Australian universities at different times, uh, create change, uh, life impact, research with impact, make change, change your life, change the world. A university for the 21st century, the university that makes a difference. Um, I think we can see that this sort of stuff is clickbait. Um, in the article, I talk about the fatuous hubris of these slogans. Um, that's strong language, admittedly, but I really do think that they they betray the ideals of liberal education. And we can see 
I mean, some measure of that, I mean, a superficial measure of it, can be seen if we contrast those, those slogans, as I say, the products of marketing departments, with the much older proverbs that still adorn the archaic coats of arms of some of Australia's universities, particularly the ones, um, the big, uh, um, big state universities, and you know, uh, in the big cities uh, that that date from the the nineteenth or earlier part of the twentieth century. So here's another representative sample: sub cruce lumen, light under the cross, scientia manu et mente, knowledge by hand and mind. Sidere mens e adam mutate. The stars change, the mind remains the same. Ancora imparo. I am still learning. Well, I think you can see a pretty uh, marked contrast here. The uh, new slogans are dominated by images of change and impact. They generate a sensation of hectic and thrilling novelty. By contrast, the older, slogan, uh, older proverbs were sober and modest. They emphasize the patient and hard-won hard acquisition of learning and enlightenment. And they suggest that a university education is more concerned with what endures than with what changes. Well, the slogans... As I say, they are representative of the 21st century university. And the 21st century university has become dominated by the commercial priorities of mass undergraduate vocational training in support of an elite layer of specialised research. And these priorities are mandated by governments and they're demanded by an international market. It's particularly true in Australia where our universities are hugely dependent financially on international students. Still, there do remain some nooks and crannies of the university. They might be secreted away in parts of a humanities or in sciences school or perhaps in an older professional school like law, which are still able to afford sanctuary for scholars and students who, so far as circumstances allow, can escape the preoccupation with their prospects for commercial rewards, for popular flattery, or the flattery of their peers, the professional prestige. Their reward is one of the mind and spirit. What Michael Oakeshott, who I mentioned before, described as an initiation into a civilised inheritance of a world of meanings and understandings, a world comprised of languages, literary and other artistic creations, philosophical arguments, scientific theories, historical writings and theological and political reflection among other things. And not just any of these, but, and this is crucial, the very best of them that have been created. The writings which make up this inheritance, which by definition an inheritance is something that comes down to us from the past, it can't come for the future or the present. These are often referred to as the great books, and so that's the sort of, I'm using that phrase as a sort of handy term. Um, the United States in particular, education in the United States has had a long, uh, a long history of um, education based around great books. Some universities and colleges in the States uh, include a significant selection of the great books as a required component of uh, their basic undergraduate curriculum. Others often offer a standalone degree or certificate devoted entirely to the study of the great books. And that is the model followed recently here in Australia by a private philanthropic body uh, uh, called the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization, which is funding the establishment of a degree in Western Civilization based on the great books at selected Australian universities. And it's enjoying, uh, they've made arrangements with three universities. And I believe that, or that it's still early days, but they're enjoying considerable success. And it's a, uh, an enterprise that I thoroughly uh, recommend. So what I want to offer to you here, um, as I said at the start, is 
some advice for anyone who may be fortunate enough to be a student in such a course because you really do enjoy a remarkable opportunity. You're afforded, uh, it's a, the opportunity afforded to you is one inside what Oakshot called the interim, which is a kind of sunny recess be between the, uh, the uh, sheltered world of childhood and adolescence and the onerous responsibilities of adulthood. And in this interim, you, enjoy, you can enjoy without distraction an induction into that great inheritance. And it's unlikely that you're going to get it again <laughs> uh, once the burdens of uh, work and family uh, impose themselves on you. So I hope that what I say here will help you make the most of your experience. Uh, these thoughts are not exhaustive. I've listed them into 12 uh, tips, um, uh, but they're, they're not gospel. And uh, you should judge for yourself what value you think they have. Okay. So here is tip number one. Beware shortcuts. Um, in any university uh, curriculum, there are two broad kinds of writings that you're going to encounter. Uh, first of all, there are those books whose value is instrumental. They exist for a clearly limited purpose and their value is exhausted by the success in fulfilling that purpose. And that purpose is normally to impart information or to give instruction in a practical skill. It is in the nature of such texts that they are readily substitutable. If one fulfills the same purpose better than another, then it can and should okay, supplant the first one, which can be discarded. Now, given this fact, and given also the rapidly changing world and information and skill thus served, these kinds of texts tend to date badly. <laughs> okay. um, they are, however, the most common kinds of writings you find in the modern university, and in vocational professional courses they comprise nearly all your reading. When I say that they date uh, badly, that probably needs some uh, qualification. Uh, there are, uh, you know, in a subject like uh, medicine or law, there are, you know, fundamentals which don't change over long periods of time. And even, uh, and there are even classic, you know, uh, texts for teaching some of those fundamentals and um, also perhaps reference books uh, uh, like Gray's Anatomy and, and uh, ones like that in the case of medicine, um, which um, certainly show uh, uh, a, a powerful, uh, uh, very considerable uh, power of endurance. Um, uh, it's where you get towards, as is the case in many uh, disciplines, uh, or many professions and occupations, uh, which are rapidly changing in their practice uh, and where a textbook or a uh, work of reference uh, needs to be up to date, that's where the liability to become out of date and to be substituted to, to, to um, substitution um, becomes most, most marked. Okay, so that's the first kind of book you're likely to encounter in a university education. Um, by contrast, other books which I'm calling the great books, their value cannot be measured in the same way. I mean, Homer, Plato, the Bible, Shakespeare, Dickens, yeah, these, their value cannot be captured in concepts like those of information and skill. I'm just going to assert that here. But I might discuss this in, in more depth in some, another video, but I'm just going to assert that here. They serve no purpose beyond themselves, and consequently they resist substitution. So they're not vulnerable to being outmoded by the shifting sands of changing purposes and interests, new technologies and the like. So long as one remains interested in the basic questions of what it is to be human, these books remain relevant. Well, the first kind of text is, of course, perfectly appropriate for, for some subjects. 
You've had a textbook about, I don't know, uh, contract law or um, fruit fly genetics. It's a summary of the field and it's usually adequate, not only for exams perhaps, but amplified and refined through the actual practice as a lawyer, as a scientist, it may remain useful for a good part of your professional life. Again, as I say, depending on the extent to which you, the text is trying to bear on the current uh, sort of sharp end of contemporary practice. Significance amount of what is central to, indeed to law, or to genetics, or to medicine, can be wrote, learned from these books. The subject matter can be more or less mechanically assessed with black and white answers. Now, of course, intelligence, intelligence students are going to want to ask deeper questions, questions which require the exercise of one's own creative intelligence and judgment, and, and, and which admit of more than one arguable treatment. But the capacity to do this profitably matures with one's grasp of the agreed fundamentals of the subject, and it typically comes later in one's learning. And one might add um, that the sciences, and particularly um, uh, professions like medicine and law, especially medicine, um, there's a lot of know-how as, as well as a lot of a lot of knowledge how, as, a, as, as well as a lot of knowledge that. That is a lot of practical knowledge, a lot of practical know-how that you have to require. And as often I suspect, I have no direct experience of it myself, but I suspect that it's in the, the context of making the bridge, if you like, between your book learning and your, and your practice that the, the budding scientist, the budding doctor, or even the budding lawyer um, most often uh, will confront those, those deeper questions. Okay. So, at least until those deeper questions are reached, um, which often can be a fair way into one's learning, uh, or fair ways into one's learning before one can discuss them profitably, or what is slightly different, before one will uh, no scrap that it's not different okay um, so those first kind of books textbooks reference books they have their proper place primary place in subjects which to which important fundamentals are subject to pricey and in which rote learning continues to play an important part. But great books necessarily resist pricey, and little or nothing of value can be acquired from them by rote learning. I mean, look, you can summarize the plot of King Lear, okay, and if you're going on mastermind or something with Shakespeare as your special subject, okay, then it's fine for that purpose. But if you remain at that level, you're just going to miss most of the play. Great books require intelligence and judgment and the exploration of not just a good memory, not just a high IQ, but intelligence in a wider sense of the word. Intelligence implies the capacity for uh, the capacity to require powers of discrimination and judgment. They also require the exploration of sometimes quite fundamental disagreement and they require it right from the outset. You cannot the way you can and must in law or science or medicine, simply take an agreed body of doctrinal knowledge for granted and memorize it. That doesn't mean that anything goes. <laughs> okay. Some readings and ideas and arguments are clearly better than others. But for a significant range of discussion, there is no agreed body of knowledge, but rather an ongoing disagreement and discussion. And you've got to make your own way within that discussion, reaching your own conclusion and making them your conclusions including perhaps especially conclusions or working assumptions about matters that are foundational to the genre or the discipline. And you've got to do that through the seriousness and quality of your own attention and thought. As Oakeshott puts it, you're not being initiated into a craft or a religion. You're not being catechized in a doctrine you must accept as a condition of membership. But you're invited to join an ancient and ongoing, in his word, conversation. And no one can tell you your place in that conversation. 
Okay, so the, the moral of all this is that in the study of your golden of the great books, it's a golden rule always to go to the original text. Accept no substitutes. And this rules out not only explicit clib, explicit cribs like you know reference books, cliff notes, Wikipedia, but also textbooks, websites, movies, and YouTube videos. There's no drive-through enlightenment. Um, I'm probably overstating things a bit here. These things I've listed can be useful adjuncts, and film is certainly itself a legitimate object of study. Um, but their value is distinctly limited, and I must always take a second place to the text that they serve. Okay. Second tip. Beware promises of abstract skills. There are courses and books that offer abstract skills in the place of concrete study of the great books. More generally, they promise you uh, form without content. They promise you uh, some sort of technique which is itself content neutral, subject matter neutral, and which you then apply to different subject matters indifferently. The technique is always the same, the subject matter differs. differs. Now, in particular, and here I'm drawing an experience in my own discipline of philosophy, university will often, often, often offer to students subjects in you know, how to think. Perhaps they're called critical reasoning or names like that. And these make a promise, in my view, a false promise of reducing thought to a trainable, semi-formal technique, separable from but applicable to, as I said, any particular content. And this is just another shortcut. Serious thought is not separable from content. If you want to think seriously about some subject X, okay, what you need is to immerse yourself in X. Um, of course, in fairness to the, the other side, uh, I mean, they say there are two elements. You've got to have your technique, and then you've got to have a subject matter to apply it to. So I should point out, in fairness, they're not denying that you need to acquire a subject matter, but they, the tendency is to think of that subject matter, that content, as something like data or information. And the thinking about that data or information is something distinct from the, con from the content. It, it's a formal... Not, not formal in the sense in which logic is formal, but a, um, a technique um, uh, that um, at least would have as its it scream ideal, okay, being able to be formalized. Um, and um, I mean, I can give an example that might help is I once heard a, a philosopher say um, that uh, we were discussing uh, the learning of, of languages and he said that what one needed to, uh, what was going on in acquiring a language was the acquisition of information or data, the study of French for example. Now, at a certain level, that can be true. I mean, you, you can rote learn vocabulary, you can rote learn rules of grammar and so forth. There is that, a substantial aspect of that in the, in the acquisition of a language. That's true. Um, but you reach the point, okay, if you're any good at it, okay, you will reach the point where um, simple techniques of memorization and rote learning become inadequate not only to ordinary speech but also to what is deeper and more important here namely to understand a language in the context of its literature and the culture from which it comes and that inevitably I would argue again I can only assert it here but it leads us into notions where uh, being able to think profitably about the French language 
how it differs from other Romance languages and from non-Romance languages, to be able to think about what's distinctive about French as it's expressed in literature or in the life of French people. What it is to be able to think about these things is not to have a grasp of a transferable technique that applies indifferently to all subject matters. It is something which is going to be distinctive to the French language itself in its human context of French life, French culture, French civilization, French literature, and so on. What is good, profitable thinking about that subject matter is just something that can only be acquired from immersion in that subject matter itself. Um, and to think otherwise, okay, is going to be a recipe for consigning, us, consigning yourself to insularity. Now, I'm not wanting to deny that um, some of the methods taught in critical thinking courses can sometimes be helpful. I'm not saying there's no place for them at all. But they are no substitute for the original great books as your main focus. You've got to struggle with those books. You've got to come to terms with them, even if the terms are sometimes ones of temporary or partial defeat. But it's patience and persistence that bear fruit. Okay. Tip number three, the so-called academic fallacy. This is my name for the idea that the most important reading that you'll do as an undergraduate is the highly specialised type found in academic journals. Now, this is very common in the modern university because being heavily invested in research, there is strong de facto pressure exerted to treat undergraduate curricula in non-vocational subjects as a kind of uh, a prolegomena, consist of prolegomena uh, for postgraduate study. So courses, undergraduate courses become like filters for the identification of talent for advanced research. And this means that the ideal of the generally edu well-educated person, the non-specialist, well-educated person is gradually been well for a long time now been fading for view this is why you often find that reading lists are full of you know even even at first year sometimes they're full of abstruse specialized articles from selected from academic journals uh, and most of those articles are probably published in the last 20 years or fewer now that literature certainly has its place in postgraduate study, but it can be a serious trap for the undergraduate. It can be, tends to be narrowly focused to the point of pedantry. It's vulnerable to fads that pass quickly. And it can close the mind prematurely on certain modes of reading and thought, certain assumptions about what the questions are, what the right methods are, and so on. I mean, I speak with some passion on this because I'm somewhat of a... Uh, um, uh, dissenter inside my own academic discipline, my previous academic discipline before I retired, which was philosophy. Um, and uh, I can see that it, it is always possible for disciplines to be under the rule of ideas which are significantly misleading or mistaken in some way. Now, there are degrees of this. Um, the mistake may be, uh, may be profound and deep um, without being stupid or silly um, and without seriously, uh, may, may limit the subject uh, may take you away from truth, okay, uh, but without being a threat to it as a viable discipline and without being a threat to the ideal of university education, which these tips are in part assuming and even in part delineating, um, 
So the, the degree of the mistake can vary, but the assumptions can be vulgar in various ways. They can even be ruinous in some cases. Um, now one example, in my opinion, would be the assumption that science, as modeled by the hard scientists like physics, is the ideal or even the only genuine uh, form of human understanding and that all academic disciplines should aspire to it. I think this is a damaging assumption. I don't think it's one which... Um, it's not the worst kind of assumption you can have by any means. Uh, um, though it can open the door to worst assumptions. On the other hand, it can also... Um, it's certainly... It's certainly perfectly consistent with a liberal education. Uh, well, mm, that's a little strong. Um... It, it can certainly, it would certainly be damaging to the ideal of a great books education, I think necessarily, and I would strongly oppose it at that for for that reason, in, apart from any other. Um, but I don't know that it is fully a threat in itself to uh, the ideal of a liberal education more generally. Though I think it does push that ideal in an unprofitable direction. Now, the opposite pole to what we might call that scientific era, as I would see it, um, and I think this is a a much more uh, threatening, even toxic assumption to the whole ideal of well of education generally. And it's the idea that literature or even science necessarily reflects only the point of view of the people who have created it, white European males, and that it serves only their serves only their interests. And indeed, that there is no such thing here as knowledge or understanding, but only the contest of different uh, forms of power. This is a very influential idea at the present time. Uh, I think it's thoroughly... <laughs> thoroughly bad and quite inconsistent with the with any reputable ideal of education. It necessarily lends itself to indoctrination. That's not to say that uh, I'm not saying that in either the case of scientism or in the case of this kind of um, idea that uh, everything is just about power. Um, I'm not saying that there is nothing at all to learn from these modes, from these, uh, from these modes of study, um, I mean, science uh, can throw a lot of light on topics in the humanities. Um, uh, equally, there can be profit in studying uh, vested interests uh, and forms of power behind, uh, you know. Um, different kinds of texts and ideas and so forth. Uh, but if these ideas are pushed to the point of being overbearing, okay, as they often are, uh, they overbear all other ideas, then the great texts are being grossly oversimplified, when one of their chief characteristics is their multifaceted complexity. So I think those ideas do need to be resisted. The great books, especially those of created literature, are great because of their depth and shrewdness of their attention to human life. Our own thought must centrally involve appeal to life, and if we are wise, we will not rely merely on our, only, our own paltry stock of observation that we might have acquired in, what, 21 years of life, okay, uh, but also on that accumulated body of observation which has come down to us from the great books. By contrast, a lot of academic scholarship tends to high degree of philosophical abstraction, even when the discipline is not philosophy. It's often a bad sign in the discipline when it becomes invaded with philosophy, but anyway, I won't get started on that. And that's not just, you know, kind of uh, <laughs> uh, you know, defending the turf of philosophy. Um, um, often preoccupation with the foundations of a subject, not always, but often can be symptomatic of a crisis of confidence inside of a discipline, of a discipline having lost its way. Um, 
So as I say, um, specialized academic scholarship often tends to a high degree of philosophical abstraction. And that kind of abstraction, the relation of life to that kind of abstraction is oblique and obscure. If one you know, contrasts with, say, the more um, palpable connection to life that, say, literature typically has. Not all forms of literature, of course, but, but many. Now, abstraction is an inevitable and important part of thought, and it has a legitimate place in the study of the great books as it does in the study of anything. But if the books are treated as answerable to these abstractions, then things are the wrong way about, and our understanding of both the books and the abstractions suffer. Even the great books of philosophy and theology, which traffic by their nature in formidable abstractions, are importantly beholden to attention to life if they are not to go badly astray. Okay. Um, tip four, and this is related to the point about um, abstraction. Tip four, let the book speak. Um, well, the previous tip was warning against abstract ideas taking over from the text. A very hard warning to heed in practice. We nearly all sin against it. Uh, but there is a world of difference between a reading that allows the book to challenge the preconceptions and ideas that we inevitably bring to it, and a reading that does not allow that, which, as it were, wants to foist its own ideas onto the book to smother it with these ideas. Now, the latter kind of reading treats the book with condescension or even contempt. Great books are not confinable to ideology. The power to disrupt our assumptions is one of the things that make them great. Now, here, just a warning, one needs to tread carefully with this. In academic literary study of the last, or well, nearly a half century now, there's been a lot of talk of texts as disruptive, transgressive, and so on. But I'm not talking about contrariness or rebellion for their own sakes. We're not about setting out to shock here. It's not, it's not or not necessarily to be for or against any established order. Um, you know, these days, one often hears the word critical in the name of, of various subjects, you know, critical X studies, uh, as if somehow or other, you know, more traditional fields were mindlessly uncritical. Too often the use of the word critical here means simply to be against something, when really what critical should mean is something more like discriminating. That is, someone who exercises informed and intelligent judgment. Worse still, the word critical sometimes signals an expectation of subscribing to and rolling the text and yourself in the service of an ideology. So what you really need to do is to cultivate an attention to the great books and an independence of judgment that you jealously guard. Now, it's no contradiction of that to say you also need a, a, a certain humility, a wish to learn from what better judges than ourselves have, have seen and thought and said. And that's one reason why you just cannot replace the great text with the study of the ephemera of popular culture. Now, such study can be interesting and intelligent and important, especially, okay, uh, in the work of an author whose mind is being trained in the great text. A good example would be George Orwell, who wrote very... Um, uh, tellingly about the popular culture of the 1930s and 40s. Or a more recent example would be someone like the great Australian uh, polymathic uh, critic uh, Clive James, who could move so seamlessly between high culture and low. Um, so I'm not against, you know, I'm not against critics and writers and academics studying popular culture or conducting research on popular culture even. But what I am against is the idea of giving popular culture some central place in undergraduate education. Um, the objects of 
you know, popular culture objects, as objects of study, popular culture items typically have very limited power to free you from bad ideas. <laughs> um, and it's one of the reasons that the, the forms of study based around them tend to be highly ideological. And by contrast to that, the study of the great books can mean intellectual liberation. The texts themselves can rescue for you from the influence of a lazy or activist teacher. So to keep ideology at bay, it's a good habit to read the great books unhindered by an eagle eye on contemporary debates and relevance to them. Now that has its place, okay? But as a dominant mode of reading, it encourages anachronism, and an instrumental attitude to texts as resources to be plundered and prostituted in the service of a cause. If these books are truly to do their work, they take us away from our own time, our own familiar, perhaps so familiar as to go unnoticed assumptions um, and ways of seeing, and to introduce us to times and places, to worlds that are very different from our own. Now, they can only do that if they are not, as I put it before, smothered at birth by the zeitgeist. <laughs> birth in your mind. If your mind does not smother them, or your teacher, your teacher does not smother them from the, outside by the, from the outset by the ideas of the zeitgeist. You know, it's ironic, but it can be true that sometimes we learn most about our own time uh, by getting some distance of it. We're too close to our own milieu to be sure about what will last or even what its deepest problems are, let alone what their solutions are. Okay. Point five, keep your distance. What do I mean here? Well, it would seem obvious, indeed banal, to say, you know, don't assume you know everything. Um... It's a little less obvious uh, that we need to learn not to assume that our teachers, and even more so again, the current big names of a subject, one also needs to learn not to assume that they know everything. Now admiration is a natural and warm human quality, so long as it's kept in check. So honour and praise those that you admire. Feel free even to become a protege, but avoid becoming a disciple. A certain distance is always good. And relatedly to this, don't dismiss what you haven't read or what you don't understand. If, you know, a significant number of thinkers, especially ones you admire, then and now have found value in a work, then you should assume there's something in it, even if you're finding it hard to relate to. You can put it aside and come back later. You can ask someone else to explain it to you. This doesn't mean that you have to, you know, show... Uh, um, tremendous patience with barefaced bilge, but you shouldn't jump too readily to the conclusion that that's what you're dealing with. And equally, and this, and this I think is an important point, too often neglected, that we should try not to uh, uh, um, admire and praise a work without reading it. Mechanical, mechanical deference to the great books does them no service. It just circulates a bad odour of snobbery and dishonesty around the whole enterprise of teaching them. That said, don't be intimidated or embarrassed by the charge of elitism. Uh, many of the great works, uh, were, especially some of the very greatest, were genuinely popular. I mean, the Homeric sagas began as dramatic oral traditions, as did much of the Bible, which for a long time after being written down uh, was read aloud to, to the unlettered in, in synagogues and churches. Um, Shakespeare's plays attracted the city crowds of Elizabethan London the way cinemas do today. And then when they make Shakespeare or Austen or Dickens or Tolstoy into films, we attract an audience which is certainly much wider than a mere academic cast. So potentially at least these books can be part of, can belong to a democratic culture. Um, uh, I mean, 
I'm afraid to say it in a way, but I fear that um, it's the academic study of uh, the great books which might endanger that link to a popular culture. Um, but I need to think more about that. Um, I mean, I'm thinking again of someone like Orwell or Clive James who could move so seamlessly between high culture and pop culture and speak intelligently about all of them. Uh, that might, on the face of it, look inconsistent with what I said about not putting pop culture, not giving pop culture any significant place in an undergraduate curriculum. But I don't think that it is, because as I, as I think I did say before, when I touched on Orwell and, and James, that it was their background, it was their background in the great books which um, enabled them to think so insightfully about popular culture. I mean, there is a lot of popular culture. I mean, it depends which parts of popular culture you're talking about. I mean, it varies enormously. Um, uh, but there is certainly material which is very worthwhile. And... Um, uh, the right attitude, I think, from a university teacher is that one has to prioritise in educating youth w those things which are the most important and of the highest quality without thereby implying that somehow or other an interest in uh, the items of popular culture is somehow or other bad or to be avoided or inherently wrong. Elitism is certainly bad when it takes the form of excluding some people who have the aptitude and interest to read the great books. But it's not elitist. In fact, it's the opposite of elitism. It's inclusiveness to teach the great books to anyone willing and able to learn, be they middle-class university students or be they homeless people or prison inmates. What matters is not who you teach, but what you teach. Um, a quick point, uh, number six, about learning another language. This is a ticket to a new universe. If you've got a gift here, exploit it. Um, to refer yet again to Clive James, uh, he never finished his PhD, I think it was on Shelley, his Cambridge PhD. He dropped out um, and it was at least you know, partly because, mainly probably because he was he was uh, too gifted to be confined and too expansive in his mind to be confined to uh, a university, um, too independent. Um, but also because he'd spent so much of it, and he'd hardly done any work because he'd spent so much of his time ensconced in the university's language laboratories or taking uh, trips to the continent. Uh, and as a result, um, he just hadn't done enough. He'd fallen too far behind. But in return, he got the mastery of several European languages. And that bears enormous fruit in the essays and criticism that he was to write over the following 40 or odd years. That was a highly profitable exchange. Tip number seven, don't shirk technicality. Um, there are going to be fields of study, even in the humanities, which are going to sometimes require exact or technical study. I mean, in the study of philosophy, I was required to study logic uh, to, you know, reasonably advanced. It wasn't required, but I did. And, you know, if you were to be taken seriously as a philosophy at, at that time you, you certainly needed some some logic um, uh, and there will be other you know 
there'll be other um, situations and parts of disciplines where this is things technical mastery of, of, of something is going to be required. If it is, then don't shy away from the hard work that it's involved. Um, if it's beyond you, there is no shame in honestly admitting defeat. And that goes for learning your language as well. But there is shame in pretending to an understanding or an expertise that you lack and concealing that ignorance behind bluster, you know, trying to circumvent it by various dodges and so forth. Once again, take no shortcuts. Number eight, embrace the seclusion of a great book's education. Well, seclusion from what? Well, we might say from the pressures of the real world, quote unquote. Well, there are two threats that loom here, and both of them I've already touched on. The first is to study the great books from a merely commercial or mercenary motives. Well, the study of the great books is unlikely to make you rich. Um, still, you know, of course you want to be able to earn a living at the end of your university education, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and the study, and you know, a certain, a certain uh, malarkey notwithstanding, uh, the study of the great books does little to directly contribute to that unless you're going on to have a you know, career as an academic or something. Um, but at least in developed economies, there's no necessity to repudiate a great book's education on that account. If you're intelligent enough to, to study such a course with profit, then you're intelligent enough to find a decent job at the end of it. And employers will recognize that merit, probably even if they're Philistines themselves. So I wouldn't let that put you off the study of the great books. Your study of them does require shelter from the business of getting on in the world, uh, but it does not demand a vow of wholesale renunciation. Um, so I think, you know, it's unlikely that many people would, would study uh, the great books from a mercenary or vocational motive. The more likely temptation is that of your know, political motivations. Um, my advice, which would probably be predictable from things I've already said, is to avoid subjects that are heavily freighted with ideological and activist goals. Now the point here is not that these causes are good or bad. I'm not making any call on that here. The point is that activism is not education. Even in service to the noblest cause and conducted by the most principled of practitioners, and how often will those conditions be satisfied? Um, it necessarily coarsens understanding on account of the concessions, the adaptations and abridgments that are necessitated by the exigencies of political warfare. And the pressure for this is, is inescapable and it typically inclined to multiply and if no factor counteracts it, it will metastasize into distortion and eventually into outright lies. And this is just the corruption of education. This is not to say that you should not be involved in contemporary political debates and campaigns and so forth. It is just to say that politics is one thing and education another, and the latter, the latter cannot do its work if it's in thrall to the former. So you pass from the street march across the threshold of the seminar room to the calm and patient consideration of the works under study. The slogan and the chant, which are essentially instruments of intimidation, I mean, they are, okay, that gives way to reasoned argument and close and serious attention to others and to their words, spoken and written. Clamour and threats yield to civility and collegiality. Rhetoric to honest discourse. Conflict and the search for advantage to the common goal of understanding. Victory and conversion to mutual enlightenment. Debate and polemic, however scholarly and sophisticated, to what, following Oakshot, I've already called conversation. This does not mean a sacrifice of principles and convictions to some form of dilettantism or antiquarianism. It does not mean the absence of sharp and sometimes heated disagreement, though it does mean keeping this within limits that serve the ideal of a community of scholars seeking understanding. And this, I think, should be the real meaning of a safe space on a university campus. The limit is not absolute. A student and a scholar remain a human being, and peace is not to be had at all costs. Sometimes the world will breach their wall of seclusion, and sometimes it is right that it should. 
But if it knocks the whole wall down, then it demolishes the distinctive good that liberal education exists to offer, and which it is hard to find elsewhere. So the, young, the undergraduate is young, you're on the threshold of life. Few of you will become paid scholars, though I do hope you will be lifelong readers and thinkers. There is space enough outside the seminar room and time enough in a life uh, for the busyness of the world. Let this refuge from the world be what it is, and it will repay you in riches. Number nine. Remember that persistence is a virtue. So look, don't exhaust yourself with a super load of hard work, consuming every evening and every weekend. Steady, regular and moderate habits are what is required. Okay, The tortoise, not the hare. The marathon, not the sprint. However gifted you are, don't assume intelligence is enough. Sudden concentrated bursts of energy may get you through an exam, but they will not bestow depth of appreciation and understanding. So remember, if you neglect these texts, if you trifle with them, they will punish you. Number 10, be conservative and liberal. Now, of course, the great books of the traditional Western canon are not the only ones worth reading. Um, nor are they saying that they, they should be the only ones on a, a university curriculum. For one thing, as well as great books, there are also excellent books. And then let's call them very good books. Another reason is that decisions about what gets into the canon are not made in heaven. They were in hard decisions made by particular people at particular times and places. And the decisions are subject to all sorts of contingencies and extraneous factors. This does not mean the content of the, ca the canon is wholly arbitrary and unwarranted. But we should be alert to various influence that are influences that affect what gets included and what does not. And we should be ready to revise. So as we all know, these days there's a particular concern that the canon unjustly reflects the power and interest of the Western world and unjustly exclude the works of other civilizations and, and of other groups within Western civilization. Now, in principle, this is a perfectly legitimate concern. Each generation should consider the canon in the light of its own conditions without making it merely a function of those conditions. Now, but this is not to take a wrecking ball to the canon. Um, the wrecking ball attitude tends to go with the crudely reductive theory already mentioned that books and ideas are just about power, weapons in the conflict between various social strata, the rulers and the dominated. But this is ultimately a nihilistic position. The truth is that reform is best conducted by people who love that which is that, that which they reform. For it is they who have the best interests of that thing at heart. Now that love means for an, inherent, an inherently conservative enterprise in the best sense of that word. And what gets conserved is not so much particular texts, though it's certainly true of some, Homer, uh, the Bible, Shakespeare, they're the most obvious ones. There are texts that it is very hard to see them ever being displaced. But what gets conserved is not so much the particular text as the continuity of the conversation and the kind of spirit in which it is conducted. That spirit is or should be liberal in the best sense of the word, okay? Magnanimous, generous, expansive. We would be unfaithful to that spirit if we regarded the canon as wholly closed and unchanging and unfaithful to the conversation if we did not allow it to take new and unexpected directions, albeit without losing touch with what has gone before. So this liberal spirit will, spirit will welcome the inclusion of the new of neglected and previously foreign works wherever they are found. And so perhaps the guiding spirit here or guiding thought would be that expressed by Terence, the Roman playwright, in his words, Nothing human is alien to me. Tip number 11. Take delight in your studies. Okay, I think you should make time each day to read just for pleasure and interest, even if you can manage it only for an hour or even just half an hour. Now, your formal study will sometimes rightly require you to read material you will not always enjoy, 
And there's no point to making this kind of bur this kind of study a burden as a whole. I think the most underestimated advice is just to enjoy your learning. And maybe that pleasure will rise to a lasting love. Okay, last tip number 12. Value your education. Perhaps I should say cherish your education. If you have the opportunity to study these books in the leisure and energy of your youth, then carpe diem, seize the day. You enjoy a privilege that few people will ever know. And I think we can measure that privilege by looking at how some human beings have turned to what they have learned from such an education to seek a sustaining meaning, a refreshment of the spirit under, condi under conditions designed to destroy that spirit. Um, so, <laughs> uh, from time to time, uh, when my students used to complain about essay deadlines and so on, them, I would uh, read them passages from, or tell them various stories, um, passages from various works. Uh, but this is one of the ones I used most often. And it comes from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Gulag Archipelago, his titanic account of Stalin's system of prison camps for political dis dissidents in the Soviet Union. And I'll read it to you. At the Samarkar camp in 1946, a group of intellectuals had reached the very brink of death. They were worn down by hunger, cold, and work beyond their powers. And they were even deprived of sleep. They had nowhere to lie down. Dugout barracks had not yet been built. Did they go and steal, or squeal, or whimper about their ruined lives? No. Foreseeing the approach of death in days rather than weeks, here is how they spent their last sleepless leisure, sitting up against the wall. Timofeyev Resovsky gathered them into a seminar, and they hastened to share with one another what one of them knew and the others did not. They delivered their last lectures to each other. Father Savelli spoke of unshameful death. A priest academician about patristics. One of the Uniate Fathers about something in the area of dogmatics and canonical writings. An electrical engineer on the principles of the energetics of the future and a Leningrad economist on how the effort to create principles of Soviet economics had failed for lack of new ideas. Timofeyev Rosovsky himself talked about the principles of microphysics. From one session to the next, participants were missing. They were already in the morgue. Well, these people died making the effort to preserve civilization in the face of the determination to exterminate it. In your study, you become a participant in that same effort at transmitting and renewing an essential part of the human heritage. Good luck with it.